Hi, everyone. This is Danielle with the Motivity Podcast. Thanks for so much for listening. Uh, you know, I appreciate all, uh, all the listeners out there, wherever you listen to your podcast. Keep on listening. Make sure uh, you're checking out the show as we um, release new episodes weekly. Um, but today, uh, I have a special guest on the show. Uh, her name is Sue Tripoli, uh, who has her doc- doctrine. Um, she comes with a deep um, expertise of uh, AI in healthcare and is currently holding a role with Accenture as a managing director. Um, I'm excited to have her talk on the show uh, for a number of reasons, but I think we need to give um, some knowledge and expertise around AI in healthcare and how AI is making a huge impact to doctors and changing the lives of individuals with data and analytics. But that doesn't come easily, right? That, that comes um, with understanding and knowledge. So today, um, we're going to deep dive into the fundamentals of AI. We're going to truly go into what AI is solving for, what it could do, um, how it's solving real life problems, like even down to the COVID level, and how it's helping doctors and healthcare, uh, you know, solve patient problems as they're as we see sickness. We're going to talk about challenges, uh, and then we're going to go into some success stories, which we love. Um, so, Sue, give us a little bit about the, you know, those successes or what a CIO maybe would think about when picking an AI platform or understanding what AI truly is. Uh, maybe yeah. we can start there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you for the invitation. I'm excited to be here. And, you know, um, one of the key things that we end up doing, I think agnostic of different industries, including in healthcare, is we make this assumption that we all understand what AI is. Well, AI stands for artificial intelligence, but it actually could also be applied intelligence. So in that artificial intelligence, one of the most common things that you will hear is something called machine learning. And essentially what you one could broadly think about artificial intelligence within that you have machine learning, you have deep learning, you have neural networks, et cetera, et cetera. And the more advanced you get, you may get into neural networks and deep learning and things of that nature. But the basic where you begin at least is allowing the computer system to mimic various attributes of human intelligence and help you in solving large problems. So when I say large problems, we are talking in the context, for example, today of healthcare. Healthcare inherently has very large data sets because we as consumers of healthcare, um, typically, um, you know, think about it when you're uh, going to a clinician, to a clinic, to a provider, you're not just talking to just the clinician, you're talking to non-clinical folks as well. So the health ecosystem inherently at a very minimum will have things related to uh, clinical workflows, it'll have things related to your pharmacy, it'll have things related to navigating the system, your finance and your payment, et cetera, et cetera. These are core operations of any provider or payer system, right? So what we're trying to do with these machines is the machines are trying to learn and adapt that human intelligence and provide rational decisions. Now, before machine learning came into being, we were trying to do this manually. So the whole purpose of or one of the key reasons why we are using machine learning, for example, or artificial intelligence, is you model that human intelligence and thought process through the use of computers, and then you're able to take and you know tens of millions of records of tens of millions of members within the system to help you drive some business decisions as well, not just your clinical decisions, but could be business decisions. So one is business, you know, your operations, but the other one is actually getting to your efficiencies, eliminating some waste, looking at processes that need to be automated, et cetera, et cetera. And then the other part of it is really getting to say in healthcare, looking at your disease progression. So, you know, chronic care is very common in the US Uh, Diabetes happens to be part of chronic care. Diabetes is is rampant within the US outside too. It's a very common disease. And so this is where you can actually, instead of doing intervention, which costs the US health system and other systems also a lot of money, if we focus more on preventative care as a system, as an organization, and at the individual level, we are much better off both in terms of our overall health outcomes, as well as in reducing our cost and providing better and timely care, right? So part of AI, and in this, I'm just focused, for example, I just talked about 
machine learning as as an example. Yeah, yeah. But I think and when we say machine learning, the computer. So like the computers are running the data, but they need to pull the data uh, into the machine so it then can output. But you have to teach the machine and tell the machine how to run that program. Exactly. You have to simulate it and you have to simulate it to the human brain as much as possible. Now, there are some ethical issues related to it. There's some bias when you create your machine learning model. We haven't come to a point globally yet where we can say that we have mastered the art, but we can say very easily that the computer has enhanced our learning, our, our reasoning, and our perception of how we can handle large sets of data. And from there, we can glean some insights. So I think the other thing that machine learning allows you to do is that it allows you to discover patterns, you know? So just ah, think about case. it, retail, right? Google, Walmart, we all do a lot, Amazon, we do a lot of our shopping online nowadays, right? But, you know, the machine is is reading your behaviors, what you look for. Are you looking for TVs? What you, you buy. Exactly. And how so, often you buy it, when you buy it, you where buy you buy it. it. Yeah. Think about, you know, right. subscription based and, and putting that those right data points exactly. in front of you. Do I exactly. want you to talk about one key thing, though? You, you said something very specific in, in your comments. So when we think about people and solving problems with AI in relation to healthcare, it's harder, right? There's, there's data privacy. But we've learned how to use AI on the operation side. So maybe correlate those two pieces for a second. Maybe give an example of how, we use, how someone would use it on the operation side and then make it relevant um, to the healthcare side. Yeah. Because I think I'll, that's what's hard. Yeah. Yeah. And I'll do that in a minute. But let me just okay. cover some of the other fundamentals. Because one is what we mean by AI and what is included in AI. I already talked about machine learning, deep learning et cetera, a neural network, speech recognition, natural language, uh, you know, processing, et cetera, et cetera. But then you will also hear people say that we are AI powered. Now, AI powered means different things to different people. But for the purposes of this podcast, let's just say that AI can do things proactively, right? Yeah, that, yeah. You, that AI can enhance and support your decision making. And that AI is very smart. You know, remember I talked about you know, uh, preventative instead of uh, intervention, right? And then there's a continuous learning, by the way, just because you've trained a model doesn't mean that it cannot get better and better and better. So it's just like an iterative process. So I'm now coming to what you were asking about, give, give an example of the value of AI, yeah, you know, yeah. within any organization, especially in healthcare, that should be tied to your business metric. Now, this is where the biggest issue comes, I think, in my opinion, is that we think that we can plug and play, that we can just, you know, we have an AI ML solution, we have data in the cloud, you know, people have gone to the cloud or at least a hybrid, and that I have large capacity to store the data, and I'm going to be able to pull that data, whatever data sets I need, I'm going to be able to make some correlations because I have my um, AI ML solution, and it should give me a set of outcomes. It doesn't happen that way. What it gives doesn't you happen that fast. <laughs> no. Okay. What it gives you is a set of outputs. It it gives you it spews back data back to you, right? So remember that we as humans, when we are making a decision, there's a lot actually that's happening in our brain. This is where the neural network really um, helps. So what we need to really understand is plug and play you know, it is one way. That's, that's, that's just the technology. AI ML is enables you to make the decision. It doesn't mean that you that's can a really good on one point. side. Yeah. You have to look at those patterns. It's you have to look at the model. You have to uh, figure out whether the set of output that it spews out, whether that actually makes any sense or not. And remember, I talked about bias, right? So this is where you start looking for bias, deficiency, risks, etc. So the last bit I'm going to say is, you know, in healthcare, before I get into the operation specific um, you, um, pros and cons and specific use cases, is, is one of the things that I like to do is I like to look at risk. I'm not going to uh, have a risk management framework or a risk value framework. Typically, C-level folks, any business, small, medium or large, anywhere in the world is thinking of, you know what, how do I expand my revenue? What kind of sales can I have? 
where is my talent and skill set? Where do I need to hire the right set of people? What sets of processes should I automate because I can't automate all, you know, 1 million of the processes that I have, especially in healthcare, right? Now, some of it is guided by compliance. Some of it is guided by regulation. Healthcare, like banking, is very regulated, right? There's a lot. So, and then the other part of it is what does the market demand? Because in healthcare, you're not just working with physicians, you're also working with pharma, you're also working with medical device companies, life sciences, et cetera, et cetera. So you have a supply chain issue, you have manufacturing issues, you have packaging issues that we also, when it uh, came to COVID, especially around PPEs and, and things, uh, things of that nature. So now let me go into, you know, what are the pros and cons and then get to your specific use cases because I want to share a little bit about public sector, which is very different from uh, the private sector. You had a question? Sorry. No, no, keep going. We're doing, no, it's it's very informative. No, I'm just, we're listening. I'm listening and gathering information. We're good. Okay. So what, where should we not use AI now, right? So privacy violations, you mentioned it earlier, deep fakes. We saw that during, you know, the whole um, uh, electoral process. Again, agnostic of which side you're on, it doesn't matter, but you can't just rely on every single information because there are those deep deep fakes. I talked about- To Sue's point, which she said before, the the data is is giving you guides. It's not solving all the problems. It's giving you information to make a better informative decision. So I just want to keep that in So, you know, obviously you just, you know, talked about private sector. It was hard to rely on that data because there were so many human emotions tied to those, to, to all that data. It could have guided us, but it was, it, I think it was just too heavy on both sides. But to Sue's point, what she's saying, you know, if you're hearing that piece, it is just giving you more information to make a better informative decision as you look at holes or anything in your operation. Right. And, you know, the other thing is its speed, right? What I would take, Correct. what you and I would take months to do, even if we had large global teams working with us, is that for an organization, speed agility, accuracy, all of that matters, right? Now we are in sustainability. Now you're going to see more and more and more about climate change. You're going to hear more and more and more. Doesn't matter again, which company you are and where you are about, you know, whether or not we can sustain that. So one is at a societal level. We are talking about the world. So that's more at a societal level. The other one is at an organization level for you as a business. And the third one would be at an individual level as well, right? So you have to think about the appropriate and inappropriate use of AIML because you can't use AIML for every single thing because we don't have the resources or frankly, the talent and the skills to go around globally. I'm not just talking about um, the US. Now I could go into explainability and, and all of that, but I'm not going to do that. But the main thing in the pros and cons and the cons part of it is that there, you have to think about the unintended outcomes because there is bias we are training the machine, right? So the moment I say we are, that means Sue and Daniel, maybe a couple of other people based on our good judgment, but are we representative of all the 8 billion people on the planet? No, are we representing all the 350 million in the US? I I don't think so, right? So you have to really think about um, and, and account for that because at the end of the day, that is going to drive some of your business decisions as well as your clinical decisions that ultimately will have an unintended health outcome for the patient or for the member, okay? So where then is the appropriate use of, of um, you know, of, of AI? That, that is very, very, what is the, what, what are the cons? I talked a little bit about the challenges about it, but what are the pros about this? So one thing, and especially now I'm getting into healthcare, I'm going to put business operations to one side and I'm going to put clinical to one side. Let me go to the clinical because the business operations actually is the easier part um, (laughs) to to some, to some extent, uh, although someone could, could argue with, with, with that, you know, the biggest thing about AI is around medical imaging. So think about, I mean, one of the key things is around medical imaging. So think about when we are going to the doctor, whether we, we may be relatively you know, healthy today, 
but and hopefully forever but down the road we all have x-rays of some kind right we all have medical we have images now medical imaging is very very important because it allows you to see what the human naked eye sometimes may miss right yeah. and so you're able to actually detect very early on you know what are some of those issues and that early detection actually could help save lives. So that's very, very, very important. So are they layering in AI over yes. that scan? Like, are they looking at data points as they, that scan goes through? Yeah. And, and uh, you yeah. know, some hospital systems that I know, because I just had scans, you know, are still on a, I got a CD if that's, I don't even own a CD reader. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, in my head, I'm wondering how many data points are on my scan and how are they comparing that to others? And what should they be looking for <laughs> You know, that's a great use case, but to someone, yeah. let me ask this, is the hospital system, would that be an automatic reaction from the hospital systems to run, or is that something that I would have to ask for? Hey, can you run this against others, or are they running that automatically? So, it depends on which part of the world you are, it depends on how large your health systems are. So, if you talk to, say, a Kaiser, that's yeah. a nonprofit model, I'm not su suggesting that they are the only ones. But, you know, they probably have some level of AI ML embedded. So think about radiology, next generation of radiology tools, right? Um, you look at tissue samples, for example. Again, there are di diagnostic imaging teams that are already embedded in these health systems. And what you can easily do is you can apply that, I mean, through that detection process, you can not only apply AI, you can bring actually different or multidisciplinary teams. So you're not just bringing your radiologists and your interventionists. You can also bring your patient navigators. You can bring your other folks that are non-clinical who are part of that care, the multidisciplinary care team, because they're going to look at workflows, clinical workflows, what to automate there. They're going to look at you know, uh, the different care delivery process. They're going to look at pharmacy and what processes need to be, you know, if you have a medication refill, for example, right? These kinds of things actually are already happening. This is not something new that I'm talking about in healthcare. It is happening, but can, can we safely say? Yeah, I guess I didn't realize that that's, so I, you know, you always hear about the teams that are in place and that brings up such a good point, especially from for cancer patients, right? You have these teams looking at, these scans, you know, it is an interesting concept, you know, gathering someone from your IT team to look at the workflow and understand the workflow to then, you know, assess whether AI can be a component of that play. It's such a smart operational, you know, proof of concept that they probably could run pretty easily. I just don't know yes. how much that's yes. truly happening. I mean, I love operations. I love solving problems with operational efficiency. I always think, well, oh. wait a minute, we're doing this task, but then we have this whole, great, we want to buy it. Well, what are we going to do with it, right? How is it going to help us? And I see so many flows just running yeah. over each other constantly. So, you, you know, know, that's kind of where my head is at is, okay, gr you know, all right, well, then how do you implement this and how does it work? And at what stage does it come in in the process, in the preview, I guess, the preview so, process of that scan? Yeah, so I think this is where you really have to look at it taking three steps backward. In typically, in most health systems, you're going to find that 20% of your membership actually drives, say, 60 to 70% of your cost. These are, you already mentioned. Isn't that always the case, the 20-80 rule, or, right? Yeah. It's always the case. 20% of your, or 80% of your business comes from 20% of your people. That's that's a and rule that we, we all have known, yes. That's why you'll see, you know, uh, amongst the senior population, you'll see from the government, from the feds and so on, Medicare, they'll constantly talk about uh, preventative, you know, falls. This is very, very common for seniors, right? They live slip in falls, slip right. in falls, slip in falls. And, and that actually creates a huge issue for the health system, right? I mean, just using that as an example. Diabetes is a very common problem. It's not related only to seniors. It actually begins at a very early stage. But if you're able to detect that you are pre-diabetic or you're prone based on your gender, based on your race, based on your socioeconomic data, we have what is called now the social determinants of health. And this is something that's very near and dear to me because at the end of the day, 
you know, we're all paying for each other. It doesn't matter. You could say, well, I'm not paying for the low income folks or I'm not paying for the underserved folks. The reality is we all we are all paying and we should be paying because we want a healthier society. In order to get to a healthier society and reduce some of the inequities and the disparities in healthcare, especially, it, you have to go way beyond race and gender. You have to now start looking at things that matter to people. Health is important, but you know, think of a family that can't, of, doesn't have housing or doesn't have transportation or doesn't have food or nutrition to provide for the family. Health is not going to be on top of that family's list or that individual's list, right? Health is going to be the last thing. Um, so to, to, you know, we have all these guidelines, eat healthy, exercise, this, that, and the other. But the reality is even those who have access to it, Maybe, you know, I'm going to be very generous here, maybe 30 to 40% of those who have access maybe will exercise to some extent and will partake and, and what is healthy, yeah. right? So this is where- a lot of people do it. I think they do it on their own, you know, in their own way, their maybe. Own. Yeah. Right. Right. I mean, I hope yeah. to, I hope the number's higher. I, I maybe it's higher, but yeah, I'm I'm basically driving a point that it's not just your socioeconomic, it's not just race and gender. It goes way beyond that. It's all your social other determinants that impact your health. Now, where can AI ML help you there? You know, because what you could do is you can start looking at, you can start doing predictive analytics. You can start predicting based on your population, you know, on the composition of your population, composition of your county, composition of your district, composition of your entire state, and compare it side by side so that you can start actually managing your population better. Obviously, what we've done thus far has not generally worked for everybody in the US, right? So we've got to think about, hey, I'm healthy, I really don't care. Uh, that is not how we need to think we've got to think much bigger than individual we've got to think about you know societal issues because they are impacting us one way or the other we are paying for it on the operational side you know i talked about natural language processing so clinical documentation is very important i talked about regulation and you know so one of the things about regulation is you can't just say hey you know i provided care you've got to show clinical documentation as part of your electronic health record so using artificial intelligence there, which is more on the operational side, where you take your routine processes and start automating that. You don't need a human being to go do that. You can deploy that human being to do something more effective where a human brain you know, is required rather than the you know, um, routine processes that, that just can be handled through, through the, by the machines. Uh, you know, then there are other things that you will have to look at speech. You know, we do speech recognition. You, we, you know, forget healthcare. Even Alexa, right? Siri. Yeah. We, yeah. So... I mean, I use. Yeah. You know, right. that's part of. Yeah. And, and you know, that's a development on the healthcare side is they're trying to uh, manipulate, not manipulate, but use the different languages to get the data because there are a lot of languages. What they're worried about, and I don't know, I've, we've talked about this, is just the understanding because you're dealing with um, filling prescriptions. Sometimes they're worried about the language and how the translator are picking up the different uh, amounts of dosage per, pa per patient. Exactly. Um, yeah, exactly. so that's a little bit hard, but I agree with you. I mean, I, I'm a big component. I do speech to text constantly. I use it all the time because I'm constantly writing and I'm constantly talking. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, I love that idea. And then, you know, it's learning more and more how I work. It's, it's yes. actually coming up with suggestions on how I answer emails now. It's, yeah. I think, it, you know, from, from just my little world, it's, it's very powerful. Absolutely. So, you know, whether or not we um, formally acknowledge it or not, you know, AI has crept into part of our daily yeah. work, our daily living, et cetera, et cetera, Fitbits, this, that, and the other. So think about medical devices, right? These are smart devices. You're going to get data from the, those devices that allow you to monitor that patient in the ICU or wherever else, right? And so, remember that data is connected to a network. Like I just want to take yes. it a little step further. That that yes. data and that device is connected to the network. The network can see a lot of the data. It's just how you transport the data back and forth. Yeah. So there is ways to pull data, you know, within an organization. And that maybe that's sometimes a bit of a struggle, but I just wanted to talk about Yeah. That. So this is where artificial intelligence, you know, yep. I'm talking about it because sometimes it's machine learning, sometimes it's deep learning, sometimes it's whatever else, NLP, 
you basically are collecting and analyzing data that has the patient provider information at, at the core. And through the apps, you're able to monitor the patient. You're able to provide speedier and better care delivery, hopefully. You're able to actually detect any anomalies in your data set because data quality sometimes is an issue, not just in healthcare, by the way. But at, the, at a very minimum level, you're able to focus on that individual, on that patient, on that member, and provide the right, hopefully, the right type of care with the right sets of interventions. In some cases, ideally, we'd like to do preventative care, right? Because that's again, and that becomes your treasure trove of data. So artificial intelligence plays a significant role, but I want to go back to the thing is in healthcare, there are some other issues, and that is around sharing of data. So they have fire and interoperability of data. Because I was going to ask that, like the sharing piece, like do you share, like let me ask, and I just want to understand this. If I'm a patient, would I want to know whether AI is being predictive with my healthcare? Do I, would I, would I even have a concern or not a concern with that? Or do you think it should just be part of the normal practice? Like, would you let the patient know that? Absolutely. I think so. Patient rights, patient rights, because patient uh, privacy is very high, right? PHI, yeah. nothing can happen without your consent, by the way. But the reality is, We've lived in silos in healthcare. So we, <laughs> we haven't understand. shared data. So, you know, I'm still one person. You're still one person. If you have behavioral health issues or uh, that's, and you have comorbidities and you have physical health issues, you could be a heart patient or a cancer patient or a diabetic patient. Uh, you know, God forbid that any one of us has that. But this is where your clinical decision support tools can come. This is where your AI um, artificial intelligence can, can help you. The one thing I don't want is that data is not just embedded in your healthcare records. Data is actually coming from multiple sources. It's coming from wearables, right? It's yeah, coming yeah, but how do you pull it from the individuals and go so, out, I guess? So that needs to be connected to your healthcare record. You see, we are all- What if each, I know, but not every healthcare company has no, the same healthcare no, records. And this is, and this is where you know, there's no, st in, in one sense, it's I can go purchase X, you can go purchase Y, your health organization one, I'm health organization one, your health organization two. Um, you know, every single person every has to say that, you know, we, we get it to speed, but the reality is there's a lag time, right? Because if you think about it, just from you or yourself, right? How many healthcare providers are you interacting with? Just as we talk, I have five. I can think of data that CVS has, uh, Epic has, another EHR system has, my cardiologist has something, and um, I also have, you know, this other doctor that has information. And that's five data points yeah. that I sit there and go, no, no, look at this. No, no, look at this. I would have loved, I mean, I would have, I, I would, I think, same, similar to yourself. I would want to see data on other people if I have something or I'm carrying something or I, you know, my blood work shows X. No one is telling me based on your age, based on this, the only person giving me that information is the doctor. Now, how can the doctor know that based on my age and not taking it away from the doctor, but there's no way, you know, She's just giving me a general feedback on where I stand. They're giving me general information. So, so I think one of the things that's this, this has been standard practice though, even before yet, is that yeah. there are benchmarks, right? So in there the US, yes. there are benchmarks. You're right. So there are clinical measures. There are about hundred plus clinical measures, for yeah. example, that any health system or even a payer has to collect because that's part of their accreditation. That's part of their quality bonus payment if they're in Medicare, there's something called STARS payment. So you have to collect a set of clinical data, your administrative data, your hybrid data, et cetera, et cetera. Your member satisfaction data, that these are the four or five key things that make a part that, that make up STARS. And that's only limited to Medicare. Now you can approximate that for the commercial side. So there are benchmarks. You can't just say, hey, I'm doing really well in the state of Delaware, and I think I'm the best compared to what? What is the benchmark? What is the industry right. standard? Those Where, right, what is the benchmark? Yeah. So those kinds and of then, things are published. So I think, you know, where AIML can, can come and help you 
is basically you have the data in your platform. Even if you don't have data from all the variables and the medical devices, doesn't matter. Based on what you have today, can you consolidate that into one singular platform? You mentioned Epic, right? Epic is your healthcare record, or it could be Cerna, right? Um, you know, so as the more you consolidate, the more it's not just consolidation, actually, it is also mining your data and making sure the quality of the data is actually good quality, right? And that you can stand by that data 90% to 95% of the time. Data accuracy is very, very important because there'll be some data that's missing in that or certain things that are actually just not uh, correct. So this is where also when you, if you train your machine a learning model, you will know immediately when you look at your output that something is amiss, right? Either there's a bias or the data itself was not of good quality. It's a bit too late to decipher that later. Ideally, you would like to do that early. Think, I'll, I'll, I'll give you two other examples. Think about clinical trials. The clinical trials can also use AIML, but it is actually more in the design of the clinical trial where AIML could be of great use. Same thing with drug discovery. AIML can show you certain patterns. It can detect whether your uh, drug discovery platform, whatever it is that you're using, is uh, going to enable you to repurpose the existing drugs that you have, as well as take the new drugs. So you talked about COVID, right? You have bioactive compounds, for example. I, I'm not, I'm not a, a, a pharmacist of any kind, but there are certain compounds. Think about what Oxford did in the UK and how quickly we got to Pfizer, to Moderna, and I'm forgetting, but these are the two Quick. that come to my mind. We got, right. Right. Yep. right, so how did we do that? We did that not because there were 10 people working behind it. They trained the machine to the point where they kept testing and iteratively they kept testing and testing and testing. And at some point, what would have taken three to five years, it was remarkable that we all that that got done within less than 16 months or something like that, right? But to Sue's so, point, that was a global effort. That was exactly. a global effort. We need global effort to use AI and ML yeah. because it would help us. And we're, right now we're we're running in silos. I mean, we are in silos. So, so but we're trying to break down those silos a yeah. little bit. So the, where the silos actually come, because people think, again, my ML tool will automate my workflow, will help me in my payment because, you know, I can just even look at claims and just look at outliers in my claims of those, you know, I can just, figure out whether my DMEs, my durable medical equipment folks are doing any kind of fraud. You know, all of this has been going on using AIML. But the issue still remains is that there is a human interaction, right? It's not just training. It is human interaction and deriving insights from that. So who's deriving that insight? That is still contingent on a human brain, right? So your AIML, your technology becomes more of an enabler to get to that speed, that agility, flexibility, pivoting, tweaking your AIML model, whatever it may be. But at the end of the day, you are still held responsible for reducing the risks. So I'm now going to close this by saying, what are C-level folks really, really worried about, right? What they are worried about, frankly, are things like, you know, the the, I, I don't want to use these words, but maybe I, I will. Those who are thinking of, of, of issues, they're not just thinking of the issues for the for the next 12 months. They're thinking of the issues for the next five years. This is where the predictive yeah. analytics. So they're investing the money there without any return on investment today, but knowing that futuristically, they're going to be very, very stable while they're working through whatever snags and snafus they've had to deal with on a daily basis post COVID. I'm gonna call it post COVID for right now, right? I mean, more or less um, the population has reached a point where a sizable population has been vaccinated, et cetera. It doesn't mean that COVID is going away, but it's, it's, it, we, we can, um, uh, uh, you know, restrain it to some extent or contain it to some extent if we take good measures. So I think the sea level is looking at a risk framework they're looking at where do I really cut budgets? They're looking at talent and skill sets, even with everything that's going around now. 
There's a huge paucity of labor. They're looking at cost optimization. They're looking at more personalized care. They're looking at digital assets. How do I digitize my assets so that, you know, how do I make it very interactive with my patient? So, for example, I'm a member of Kaiser. I don't need to talk to a physician. I can just go look up my medical records. I can go look up my prescriptions that I need to refill. I can just write a note to my physician and say, hey, I'm in pain today. My, my um, right eye is flickering or whatever. I'm not feeling great, whatever the case may be, right? And this is also post COVID. So during COVID, of course, there was a lot of telehealth. I'm not even going into there. But the purpose of the whole thing is you're also trying to reduce some of those disparities. You're trying to actually make health more equitable. So from a C level perspective, what they will be looking for is where do I prioritize? Where do I cut budget? Where do I spend? Where do I invest? What is my risk framework, right? Who do I need to partner with? Who are my key stakeholders within this health ecosystem that yep, I'm still yep. missing? Where is the voice of the consumer that I'm quickly able to take, pivot, and then help and personalize the care, whether it's through the digital assets, whether it's through you know uh, a um, an assistant, a virtual assistant. It could be very basic like that. It could also be where you know I don't have a registered nurse, but I can actually make a referral where someone can go immediately and get the care. I can get delivery of care at home, right? Uh, so I'm not even going, going into home health because home health is a huge area. So, and then it all, uh, it, one of the key things that at least in the US what has happened is that around payment, you know, what would not be paid typically because of COVID, um, CMS, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services said, no, you're providing good care. You're documenting whatever you're helping the client with, right? So I'm going to increase what used to be, you know, telehealth and all of that was never paid um, in the way behavioral health yeah. wasn't paid. So now they're going to pay all of that. So Actually, we have just like two minutes left. I don't want to uh, cut you off sorry. Too, too much. And I, I love this conversation and you've been, you're super insight, insightful, uh, yeah, you know, to, to everything of what AI and, and ML is. Uh, yeah, you know, thank I, you. I, that, no, no problem. And I'll just quickly leave the, you with this, um, you know, beyond the US, there are, so you go to Belgium, you go to Canada, you go to Australia, you go to India, you go to the all over the world, you're seeing pockets where they're not in healthcare. Retail is not in healthcare, but retail has gotten into healthcare. Look at Walmart, look at, you mentioned CVS, right? Um, transportation systems. So your sensors actually can help. Again, you. healthcare, driving, exactly. you know, the buses. I mean, it's, exactly. it's all connected. Yeah, yeah. It's all connected. And then, you know, improving your responsiveness. Because remember, yes. the main thing is speed, accuracy, and also utility. utility. <laughs> right. And, and AIML is supposed to help you get to that larger scale that would have taken us years, but you're able to use the digital platform, use technology to your advantage, identify which processes Definitely. need to be automated, and whether it's operations, related or clinical related it's all in a one-stop shop are we there yet no but we're definitely yes. there. we're getting there so we're getting there but you yes. have given us a wealth of information and and a ton to think about as you're looking to implement ai or use ai or machine learning and and how it's relevant to healthcare and where the industry is going so you've been tremendous thank you so much for being on the motivity podcast and uh thanks for listen listening any last words no, I'm delighted to be here. I, I, you know, I hope that we can actually uh, another area that's near and dear to my heart yes. is AI and women uh, leadership. This is a very interesting, you know, um, set of data that I've been looking at. I'm not talking about diversity, equity, and inclusion. I'm talking specifically about women in data and AI. Correct. And I think you and I were talking a little bit before before the session, saying. Yeah. And that's you know, going to be our next podcast. Yeah, so yeah, please yeah, listen, yeah. Uh, wait for part two. Uh, but again, thank you so much for being on the show and have a great day. Thank you. Thanks.